Hello and welcome to Aviadev Insight Africa, the podcast offering an insight into the new route developments in Africa. My name is John Howell. I'm the CEO and founder of Aviadev Africa, a platform dedicated to supporting the development of new air routes to, from and within the African continent. And we are just 10 weeks away from our annual event, Aviadev Africa, taking place in Windhoek, Namibia. If you want to know more and secure your space, do register now at aviadev.com. Now, as we say each month, route development is a complex process. Many just see the water cannon salute as an aircraft taxis into a new destination's airport, but there are many moving parts to consider. Route development also means the deployment of a larger aircraft type on an existing route, adding more seats or additional frequencies on the same route, but it can also mean an airline pulling out of a route as well. This podcast aims to be your monthly roundup of the latest developments when it comes to, to routes impacting our great industry, including where these frequencies have been increased or reduced or dropped altogether. Now, I can't do this alone. And so each month I enlist the support of two industry experts to make sense of the announcements and provide some commentary. As always, Sean Mendes is here with us, bringing his unique brand of pragmatism and wit to the table. And I'm sure by now, Sean is familiar to most of our listeners. But for those joining for the first time, Sean is an Aviadev Advisory Board member, an Av Geek, bringing over 20 years of experience in the industry gathered through managing airports, commercial airlines and cargo airlines in Africa and the Middle East. Our second guest, returning for his third, I think, appearance on the podcast, is Baramji Gariali, who is an aviation consultant with over 20 years of experience supporting airlines globally with their network planning and strategy and has been working in Africa for over nine years. The opinions of my guests are their own, but as you will hear, they are all backed up by very compelling reasoning. So it's now time to fasten your seatbelts as we start our taxi out. Welcome to the April 2024 Aviadev Insight Connectivity Update. Welcome back to the podcast, gents. Thank you. Great to be here. Okay, fantastic. It's good Thank to have you. you both with us. So let's start with an airline that we haven't talked about massively over the last few episodes, but one that is incredibly important for connectivity into and out of Africa, um, namely Turkish Airlines. So I was on their website doing a bit of research for the podcast, and I think I counted 59 destinations in Africa, although I'm ready to be corrected. But Sean, kick us off in terms of Turkish Airlines, their network, their, their strategy, and their view on the African market. Turkish is a fascinating airline as far as Africa's strategy goes. During the pandemic, we'd done the Sky Heroes, you know, if you remember, which you'd hosted. And one of the episodes, I think we'd had that chat about Turkish and what makes Turkish different. So I think it's worth rehashing here is that the real difference between Turkish, what sets them apart from, from the Emirates and the Qatars and whatever else, is that Turkish's Africa strategy is primarily based on the narrow body rather than the wide body. And this is something that they can leverage Istanbul's location, where the new generation wide uh, narrow bodies, such as the, the Airbus Neos and the, the 737 Maxes, both of which they have considerable numbers in their fleet of, are able to serve marginal destinations with frequencies well above what you could manage you know, on a wide body. So in, in markets where an Emirates simply could not get into because they, you know, their triple sevens are too much capacity and where Fly Dubai 737 Max does not have the range from Dubai, Turkish can easily hit those markets with, you know, with their new generation narrow bodies. And consequently, as you say, that's why they're hitting 50 something destinations in Africa, primarily in, you know, in, in North Africa, but they've also been able to get into a number of marginal markets in Africa, such as the Mauritania and Gabon and places like this, which traditionally have not had links to, to Eastern Europe and the Middle East, which is Turkish's core, core markets. And I think what we're seeing now is Turkish has actually become very important for African travelers for a big reason being that Turkey is has, at least for the next few days, one of the few countries which has never had a transit visa requirement for Africans traveling you know, to the rest of the world. If you are an African traveling you know, from Nigeria to, I don't know, say Russia, and you wanted to go via Frankfurt in the days when, you know, Germany and Russia still had flight links, you would need a transit visa for Frankfurt airport without even, you know, just to get off the plane, change planes and come back. But that's something which Turkish has never had. Unfortunately, as well, and this is, this is a bit on the downside, 
for the last year to year and a half, Turkish's roots to South America in particular, South and Central America, have been, I won't say abused, but have definitely been appropriated to some extent by human trafficking uh, organizations who have been offering paths to the U.S. southern border through Istanbul. And consequently, we're seeing Turkish Airlines is actually going to be introducing a transit visa requirement at Istanbul Airport for the first time ever in, that I'm aware of for passengers from certain countries in transit to, to basically to Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, Panama, and a few other places in Central America that they fly to. So I think it's been a very interesting set of dynamics that have been driving Turkish Airlines in Africa over the last year. And I think in the next few weeks, a lot of this is going to change as well. But speaking of changes with Turkish in Africa, there, there's also very good news because Turkish has changed a few of their routes around, adding services in many markets, for example, Accra. And I think this is a very interesting move because it becomes the first narrow body West African route for Turkish that is now going to greater than daily service. Uh, they're going to be increasing Accra from its current daily 737 max service to uh, a 10 weekly service. So the daily max plus an additional three times a week max. Now, I don't think this is really making a huge difference um, in terms of the number of markets served. It's just going to improve connection times. These two flights are going to be four hours apart. And consequently, I know that I've flown Turkish multiple times from Ghana to India, and that it always left me with eight, 12 hour layovers in Istanbul, which was fine. Istanbul is a great airport and they give you a stopover hotel rooms and the like. But now this will bring those connection times down significantly to about four hours and just make it a much more attractive option to you know, an Emirates or Qatar, which are competing with in this market. And there are other routes which they've also you know, expanded on. Abuja is increasing from four to five weekly. Bamako is increasing from six to seven and, and so forth. I can go through a full list of them, but you're not here to listen to me recite a list. But I think it's interesting. And I think this really shows where their narrow body strategy is very distinct from the strategies that the Emirates, Etihads, Qatars, and other players, Middle East and Central Europe, Middle East and Eastern European players in this Africa market have, have differentiated themselves. And I think Turkish really stands out differently for that reason. Yeah, it's a really good overview. I think it's very similar to what we talked about in a couple of episodes ago with Ethiopian and bringing in the maxes and then suddenly being able to serve markets that didn't make sense necessarily with the larger aircraft and couldn't be serviced smaller aircraft. It's that middle ground. And you look at some of those markets and you think, oh, these are really interesting, unique almost markets that Turkish serves. But as you say, it's all driven because of the new narrow bodies and the economics on those narrow bodies making sense. And the growth that, that we're seeing through Turkish is predominantly like you say, a, a frequency here, a frequency there, rather than loads of brand new uh, destinations. But Ramji, anything you want to add on Turkish that you want to point out? Yes, uh, I feel there is uh, one very important thing which has not been mentioned, is that the, one of the reasons why Turkish can fly a narrow body properly into Africa without any significant payload reduction is because unlike the Middle East carriers, say, for example, Etihad or Qatar or Emirates or Fly Dubai that could have used a narrow body, uh, th that narrow body would have payload restrictions departing from the Middle East in the daytime, especially during summer when it is very, very hot after 8 o'clock in the morning. Istanbul Airport does not suffer from that problem. That also allows Turkish to maximize the potential of the 737 MAX and the 321 NEOs into Africa. So it allows them to have as much payload as possible departing Istanbul at any time of the day because it is not 40, 45 degrees temperature when the plane departs. That is unfortunately the case for the Middle East carriers. Hence, they have massive pay they would have big payload problems if they used narrow bodies for more than a five and a half, six to seven hour flights from the GCC hubs. Secondly, I think Sean mentioned this, but I did not hear him clearly, but uh, Istanbul also has quite decent point-to-point -point traffic from majority of Africa. So that helps form a decent base load up in addition to their transit load that they get beyond Istanbul. For the Middle East, as we all know, Dubai is the main point-to-point -point market. Doha and Abu Dhabi are not that high in terms of point-to-point -point from 
majority of sub-Saharan Africa. So that's also where Turkish has an advantage over the DCC competitors, apart from uh, Emirates and Flight Dubai, for obvious reasons. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on that. And you know, just to go a bit off beyond the aviation, I think this has been a very strategic move by Turkey in order to get themselves as a player in Africa. A lot of these routes cannot be so profitable from a pure economic standpoint. But Turkish Airlines is looking very much as an instrument of the state policy and so forth. And Turkey in general has been expanding their influence, or at least trying to expand their influence into Africa. And specifically, I'll, I'll say Somalia. When I was working in Somalia 10 years ago, uh, Turkish Airlines was one of the first major international airlines to come back to Mogadishu. And it did so at a time when service to Somalia was, was not really economically viable, had a lot of challenges. I know that they lost personnel from assassinations and so forth. A couple of friends of mine were killed over there from Turkish Airlines. But they stuck through it. And this was because Turkey, the government of Turkey, really backed Turkish Airlines as an instrument of Turkish soft power. To They offered scholarships. Uh, Somalia's ATC were all sent off to Ankara and trained over there for a year. So there's a lot of influence that Turkish has been trying to build in Africa, competing with the Chinese, the Indians, the Western world, and so forth. And I think the Turkish Airlines' expansion, as Behramji said, is increasing the demand for OND traffic to and from Turkey. Turkey, and again, just helping to build these hitherto marginal routes into something that is viable. And I admire that. I think it's, it, I don't always like governments getting involved, but when it's involved as part of a strategy that is, that is clearly visible and elucidated and backed and carrying through no matter what, more power to that. It's very similar to what Ethiopia, Ethiopian has done over a much longer period. Yeah, absolutely. I think from my side, what I've seen as well from a Turkish perspective is that they're very much involved on the airport side as well. So they are running yeah. Senegal, they're running Dakar, yeah, international there. Free town. Um, free town as well. Free town and there, I think, as well. So the company is Summa that's Absolutely. quite involved. And then they've also been involved in other infrastructure projects. I think the Turkish finished off the convention center in Kigali as well, the very famous um, convention center in Radisson that uh, Aviadev actually started off at, and it's a great bit of infrastructure. So yeah, you're definitely seeing that Turkish growth and that Turkish footprint, uh, no, no more so than the airline itself. Um, but also of course, generally, as you say, sure, as a kind of, um, element of soft power and, and also investing into the African market and making it easy. You've explained it really well, making it easy for people to transit and use Istanbul as a, as a port of call. But also because it's so well connected as an airline globally, it's, it's incredible. It's destination, and that's incredible. Every, it is. Every, yes, there is. There is also a couple of other things. Istanbul's geographical location for connecting Africa to places in Europe and North America is also more advantageous versus the GCC, because the amount of backtracking that you have to do is not as much as you would have to do versus yeah. flying via Dubai or Doha. Mm. Especially if you want to fly to North Africa or even some parts of sub-Saharan Africa, it is more convenient to fly via Istanbul than it is to fly via Doha or Dubai or Abu Dhabi for sure. And that Turkish has leveraged very well, not only from North America, but especially from Europe. They get a lot of traffic from Europe via Istanbul to Africa because they leverage the, the Istanbul's hub location very well. Look at the European network. They serve literally every second airport yeah, yeah. in Europe because they've got 737s that can do it versus Emirates is stuck with the 777. Plus, they've got a virtual open skies with most of Europe because of Turkey's political situation. So it's it leveraged their strengths and, and have made good on it. And I, I think it, it's a mutual admiration society here for all of us, just respecting what they've done, even if you don't always have to like it. Yeah, it's a fantastic airport as well. I had the opportunity to go through the airport a year or so ago. Fantastic new infrastructure. So it compares very nicely to all the other yeah. Middle East airports. Oh, Sean's got a problem with just it. Get used, just get used to walking for miles and miles and miles yeah, and miles and miles. Well, I, I connected Sean, Sean a few weeks ago at Istanbul, and it actually showed that I walked 2.1 kilometers at the airport. Well, so that kind of tells you... you uh, that's good. Um, if you've got a good connection and uh, you know, you're fat, balding in middle age like me, it's not always a good thing. <laughs> I, I have a better story than you, Sean. Tell me. 
the last time I transited in Istanbul was in June 1992, the old airport. And my route was a PIA, Karachi, Lahore, Istanbul, Frankfurt, New York, Toronto on a 747-200 combi. Wow. Now that's really yeah. taking us back in time. How many, of our, how many of our listeners were even born back then? Yeah. <laughs> All of us. I was 10 years old. Now our age is showing. Our age is showing. Yeah, exactly. Mm. All right, let's let's leave the anecdotes. I love the anecdotes, but we'll we'll pause the anecdotes there for now. And let's get on to Qatar. Because again, we've talked about Qatar quite a bit in different ways over the last few episodes, but they just announced the commencement of a four weekly service to Kinshasa and DRC. And I think this is an opportunity to talk about what they've been doing in Qatar because because it was a, a huge expansion during the COVID last few years that we've seen compared to some of the other uh, the other airlines in, for, in the region. But I think you've got some interesting data and stats on the route, Baramji, and some of the, the demand data that couldn't be ignored any longer when it comes to, to DRC and, and Qatar. If you want to kick us off on this one. So for Qatar Airways, <clears throat> starting Kinshasa was bound to happen one way or the other because of how big the local market is over there and what potential it has, especially in the sense that they don't have any direct competition from its Middle East uh, neighbors, as well as they don't have any direct competition from the Far East in, uh, in, to and from Kinshasa. But naturally, they will be targeting uh, majority of the traffic. I would say even 95% of the traffic would be transit via Doha. They're tagging it with Luanda, which is in a way a safe way to start the route so that they don't put all their eggs in one basket by just focusing on the Kinshasa market. They can get help from Luan on a four weekly basis. But the biggest market that they would be targeting, I hope, is Dubai. Uh, Dubai Kinshasa is one of those markets which has grown exceptionally high uh, post COVID versus pre COVID in 2019. It was about 44,000 passengers. In the last year, 2023, it was 85,600 passengers, Kinshasa, Dubai. And the Qatar Airways flights connect very well from Kinshasa to Dubai in both directions. Uh, they have a split schedule into Kinshasa. And they've also increased their Dubai frequencies uh, for this summer. So it connects very nicely in both directions. Uh, previously, when Qatar restarted Dubai, they restarted it with only two or three flights a day. And Great. I was not connecting to few of their cities across the network in both directions. But now they're flying uh, five times a day, I believe. So it connects with nicely in both directions. And, they, and they're flying five times a day wide body, which is very important because as Africa, Dubai is a baggage heavy market segment. So I can virtually guarantee you that there will be no baggage being offloaded at Doha airport or even at Kinshasa airport for these Qatar Airways passengers going to Dubai. So that will be good. A few other markets uh, which Qatar would be targeting in an aggressive manner, which will involve backtracking via Doha, yeah, are uh, Paris and Brussels for obvious reasons because of historical colonial links to Belgium as well as uh, cultural ties to Paris. So in high season, when Air France and SM Brussels would be priced very high for point-to-point -point traffic uh, from Europe to Kinshasa, Qatar Airways will obviously take whatever those guys cannot do uh, backtracking via Doha, which Africans don't mind. I'm sure Qatar would eventually uh, open up visas for Congolese people as they've seen what uh, Dubai has done. So they'll definitely give a chance to the Congolese people to try and explore Doha, invest their money in Doha, maybe move their money also from France and Belgium into Doha bank accounts to get some investments. Apart from that, another focus market for Qatar will be China. And I don't mean the usual Guangzhou, which every Tom, Dick and Harry wants to target, but they'll be focusing on more higher yielding traffic from Kinshasa, which will be Beijing and Shanghai in particular. Beijing more so than Shanghai because of a diplomatic connection and the demand is also higher. But since Qatar has a split schedule, two flights arriving six o'clock in the morning, two flights arriving late at night, it offers the flexibility of their network to connect a variety of destinations and not only one particular hub wave bank for a particular continent or a region. So the flexibility is there. Personally speaking, I would have preferred it if Qatar flew Doha, Kinshasa, Brazzaville, Doha, but they don't fly to Brazzaville right now. 
the, they fly to Luanda. So it's, it is what it is. Yeah. No, and I think that's an important thing you brought up over there, which is the Luanda tag. And I think, again, this is something we mentioned a few podcasts ago, that Qatar in January had abruptly reduced the Luanda service down to just one weekly. And immediately after reducing it, I think after a couple of flights, they upgraded the aircraft gauge, which again showed that they cut too much on that. And I think, especially with other airlines, like Ethiopian has just increased the Luanda to daily and so forth. If Qatar wanted to be continue being relevant in that Luanda market, they had no choice but to increase the service beyond once weekly. And I think this, as, as Bairamji said, is a low-risk way of both entering the Kinshasa market, but also getting Luanda up to a reasonable enough frequency to remain viable, even if not competitive, but at least viable in that market. And I'm just balancing out as a low-risk entry strategy. And I think Qatar... As you said, John, Qatar's entry into Africa, or not entry, but Qatar's explosion into Africa during the pandemic was a, a commercially unviable grab for market share. I mean, it was intentional. It was we've had this conversation with Hendrik uh, Dupre, who's who's who led this for Qatar, been the mastermind of this, and huge respect for what he did. Basically, Qatar had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to grab a market share by entering a lot of African markets during COVID while the rest of the world was shut down and while specifically Emirates was reluctant to come back into many of these markets. And they've done this in Nigeria, Ghana, all over. But now they've got to start consolidating this, making sense of these markets that they've gone into and doubling down on the ones that are making sense and well, figuring out how to make sense of the ones that are not yet doing that. And I think this kind of thing is the logical, we'll probably see more of this where Qatar will start coming into more markets, marginal markets like Kinshasa with tags or triangles or something like that to, to try and balance frequencies and balance capacity across markets that are already serving that may be overserved and not pulling their weight as well as allowing them a low risk entry strategy into other markets. So watch the space. We'll see more coming up from Qatar in the next uh, few uh, months, I'm sure. But uh, this has been a, I, I, I'm bullish on it. Kinshasa is an underserved market to the Middle East in particular. And as Baramji says, the demand is just going up and up. And there's a definite potential for that to, to, to grow beyond just four, four triangle flights. So before we leave Qatar, I'm just, interested in a couple of things. One is that obviously this Kinshasa route, as you were saying, Baramji, is very much transit driven with other points beyond. And it's outbound Kinshasa to, to the world, really. Now, there are two things that are coming up that we're going to be talking about at AviaDev. One is that the route development isn't happening as much as we can because of aircraft availability and airlines having to say, we've got to prioritize which routes we can serve and we just don't have the air, the actual metal to serve all these routes. And basing the next com next c conversation on that is, what do you think are the chances of Qatar coming back into an, a market like Namibia, right? They pulled out of Namibia in November time. That's obviously the host of, of Aviadev. So we have a vested interest in getting these guys back in. Qatar will be at the event and obviously that hopefully will catalyze this. But what is it going to be the market or is it going to be the availability of the metal or a combination of both? How bullish do you, do you think we should be that they're going to come back into the market? Uh, Namibia, I'll tell you. Talking to people at Qatar, it's not on their radar to return anytime soon, unfortunately. There were... The market, the, the market was not performing to their expectations and there were issues beyond just the market viability in terms of the facilities and politics and everything else over there, which basically made it a, a the, the first candidate when they had to when they had to do some chop. So unfortunately, I don't see Namibia being on their immediate radar for return. And I've, I've asked the question because it would have been a good way to get to AviaDev this year. But unfortunately, it's definitely not happening like anytime soon. OK, we'll cut that bit out. That's fine. It's a totally yeah. different type of market dynamic. Whereas, as you said, Kinshasa is outbound, Vinduk would be inbound, and it just doesn't necessarily make sense with the aircraft here. Yeah. Yeah, let me just add some numbers to that because I, I just quickly looked it up at the demand from Vinduk. 
or and to and from Windhoek is not to points east. And that's very distinct among among African destinations, which have consistently been increasing their their demands to point east, whether that's the Middle East, India, China, whatever else. And the largest market east of Europe from from Windhoek is Dubai. And that's barely two and a half thousand passengers a year, which is which is absolutely negligible. So for the vast majority of markets from Windhoek are either Southern African markets like Johannesburg, Cape Town, Victoria Falls, etc. Or to Europe, you know, the Frankfurts, Paris's, Zurich's, London, Brussels, etc. With the increase of European carriers into Windhoek, yeah, we're seeing Discover has come in with a lot of flights. We've seen increasing capacity since NMB has shut down and the market has become more competitive there. I think Qatar isn't really viable as an option to connect a Windhoek, Doha, a Frankfurt when you've got the direct flights on Discover. I think even twice a day at some days. So they've they've really ten, made ten a, a big commitment to that market. <clears throat> yeah. So there's a huge commitment to that market that uh, that simply doesn't make it viable for Qatar because Qatar's strength is in market in points east and the market from Windhoek to and from points east is virtually non-existent. So the the market dynamics and Qatar's strength simply don't make sense for Windhoek. But who Sorry. knows? Who knows if we see this recovery of the outbound tourism market from China, which has been the biggest market traditionally over the last ten years. And those passengers and Namibia tourism makes a real play to say, hey, let's create some demand. Then maybe that starts to stimulate the ability to, to do this. Or potentially those, those travelers could find another way, such as through Addis, right? They can fly from China through Addis to get to Vinduk. That's going to be easy-ish if they want to do that now. So who knows? But thank you for the feedback on that. So we'll, we'll park that. I wanted to get into something that's a little bit wider but it's having a big impact on the African carriers as much as anything else, not just the African market. And that's the area political situation and, and really access to European markets for African carriers. As we know, there aren't so many African carriers that are taking Africans out and bringing them back into the continent. A lot of the or the vast majority of connectivity, as we hear all the time, is provided by non-African carriers. I think at latest, it's about eight, 83% of, uh, of people arriving into Africa arrive on a non-African carrier. However, there are notable exceptions, Kenya Airways, Ethiopian, et cetera, that, that are doing a lot of this. But they're having issues when it comes to getting access to these markets, whereas maybe some of the European or the foreign airlines are not having the same issues coming into the African markets. Sean, it'd be great to get a little bit more info on this and how you see whether it's a level playing field or not. Okay, definitely, I don't think the playing field is level. As you mentioned, it is a lot easier for legacy carriers who have already been operating from major airports in the developed world or congested airports to open routes into Africa, which is which very few airports are congested. Um, than it is for African carriers to do it the other way around. But I think the key over here is that this is not singling out African carriers directly, despite the claims of some carriers who whose business model seems to be based upon playing the victim. They shall remain nameless and <laughs> let them peacefully lie. But yes, the reality is airports like London Heathrow, airports like Dubai, Paris, Charles de Gaulle, etc., these airports are full. They have been running for decades. They have a huge demand, not just from Africa or from Europe or from North America, but the entire world wants to fly there because these are global population hubs, trade hubs, and aviation hubs. Consequently, a new entrant who wants to get into this goes to the back of the queue to get in. in if you're going into London, British Airways has invested more than the GDP of many African countries into developing their terminals, into their hubs, into their slot portfolio at London Heathrow. And it's not that simple for African carriers who, let's face it, have not had the best reputation for reliability or anything else as well. So while British Airways has its operation at Heathrow with a huge portfolio of slots and can easily realign a flight that was previously going to Amsterdam can instead fly into Lagos, for example. It's not that easy for a Nigerian carrier to just come into Heathrow and say, give me a flight at eight o'clock in the morning arrival, 10 o'clock AM departure, because that slot doesn't exist. 
it's not unique to the African market. I see exactly the same grumbles from Indian carriers trying to access Dubai. Now, why is India blocking Emirates from having more seats to India? Well, because Indian carriers who want reciprocal seats to Dubai can't get slots to do it. So you'd be giving seats to one side versus the other side. We've seen this not just in, in London, but Kenya Airways. I was talking to Martin Gitonga a few days ago, and Kenya has just has been able to get their daily slots back at Amsterdam. They had to reduce their slots. They've been operating daily flights to Amsterdam for many years. Amsterdam Schiphol has had a reduction of slots, initial reduction, then a reinstatement of slots in place. They have only just been able to reinstate the daily flights that they've been operating for 20 plus years. And these are things which are outside of the control. Again, it's not just Kenya Airways who is affected. It's, it's affected a number of other airlines. But the real politic of the situation is Africa has very little leverage with the developed world. When a U.S. carrier like JetBlue wanted access to, to Amsterdam Schiphol slots, they threw a little temper tantrum. The U.S. DOT said, you know what, if you don't give them slots, we're going to wind up taking away your slots at JFK. And... A solution was found, which, of course, both sides say was not due to the temper tantrum. But the reality is the threat of that temper tantrum. It's like a child. You know, if the kid is going to be going to scream, if you don't give them ice cream, you'll give them ice cream. It's just easier than having to deal with the screaming. And I, I think that's part of it. It's, it's definitely something that puts new entrant carriers from the developing world in particular at a disadvantage. I don't believe this is something, a lot of people claim this is racist and colonialist and whatever else. I don't think it is that. I think that is an unintended consequence of it, that it primarily affects former colonies and the darker skinned people of the world, mainly because the, the global South, the developing world, is former colonies, is non-Caucasian majority countries. And consequently, it's affecting the developing world more than it is affecting the, the black and brown world or the former colonized world. So it is an issue. It is an issue that needs to be addressed. It is an issue that, to their credit, and strangely enough, this is one of the few things I'm going to say the UK government is doing right, is that the UK government has actually opened up a public consultation on slot policy at Heathrow in particular, but this would cover all of that. The UK has previously been governed by the EU's slot policy. And one of the one of the, the positives that has come out of Brexit is while the EU has no political will to change anything on any subject, the UK now being independent of that has the ability to set its own or at least take the lead in setting a global slot policy. And uh, you know they're examining a lot of options in terms of not giving you permanent rights to slots, to making the, the current, you must operate 80% of your slots or they'll be forfeited, increasing that maybe to 90% at some congested airports. They've looked at slot auctions where, you know, on a 10-year rolling basis, one-tenth of the slots will be put up for auction and you then have to commit to how much you're going to pay to operate the slot for 10 years. Uh, increasing ability to slot trade, changing the criteria for giving new entrants slot priority. A, a lot of different options are being considered. And if you go to the UK DFTs or the page, you, you'll see the slot consultations there and you can read through it. It's a, a lot of very technical stuff that only really hyper ad geeks, not even the regular ad geek, the hyper ad geeks will enjoy. I, I really enjoyed reading it. So that kind of tells you what I am. But it's something that, that the world needs to reform, not just for the sake of African carriers, but for the sake of better competition all over the world. So maybe you know, I'll, I'll probably write about this or do some more research or some stuff into yeah. this over the next few months. But it, it is a fascinating topic. And I think most recently we've seen with air pieces entry into the London Gatwick market where they're making claims, some legitimate that they can't obviously access London Heathrow, some far less legitimate in that the, the entire British establishment is conniving to, 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 to show up their incompetence just because they're Nigerian. But more critically, I think the Kenya Airways example is pretty good, where an African carrier was going to be forced out of a market they've served for a very long time through to no fault of their own and put at a competitive disadvantage to, to older. I think that is the key thing. People who've been there for longer are getting priority than people who may be more suited to serve that market. And that's not good for competition. No, absolutely. I think there's multiple things at play here. You've got government policy, obviously a new government in the Netherlands that's quite environmental agenda and anti-aviation, some people would say. You've got infrastructure issues that there's been so much flip-flopping on, should we get another runway for Heathrow for tens of years, so decades and decades? And obviously that 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 is simply an op an opportunity that you can't offer if you don't have the space you can't offer it 
And then the final thing, which we talk about loads when it comes to visas, is reciprocity. And sometimes it's not prudent to offer everybody what you would want from there. Sometimes you have to give more to get something back. And negotiation isn't always a 50-50. And you have to then be pragmatic about the situation. But I think you've done a great job of talking us through the different moving parts. And I think there's so much that goes into it. I'm not sure I'll be joining you on the DFT website, Sean, I'll be honest, but enjoy your weekend reading that. Sounds great fun. <laughs> Send me the exact summary. That'll do. That'll do the job. Anything that you want to add, Baramji, for your experience of kind of access for African airlines into foreign markets, into intercontinental markets? Uh, not really, but I would like to add one thing which Sean said, which was correct, but I don't think so. Other airlines have actually acknowledged this properly. Airlines worldwide especially those who have suffered due to the Dutch government's silly Amsterdam slot policy, have yet to say thank you in a big way to JetBlue for stopping this nonsense that the Dutch government and the Amsterdam authorities were doing with other slots. If, that, if JetBlue did not go out of the way to teach Amsterdam airport and the Dutch government a lesson, Air India was not coming back to Amsterdam. They had suspended their flights for the winter season. They had started in June last year and they had stopped in late October because they didn't get their winter slots. There are many other examples. And I feel uh, that airlines should really say thank you to JetBlue for putting an end to this charade that, 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 that the Dutch government ended up doing. I completely disagree so, with that. I think you are, we're, we're mixing up causation and correlation. I think JetBlue were the little toddlers screaming in the corner. And while they certainly made a lot of noise, they weren't the reason why, why ice cream was purchased for dessert. Ice cream was already going to be purchased for dessert. They just got their extra scoop of ice cream thanks to their noise. And they, they like to take the credit for, for, for all their screaming and getting the ice cream. If, if you research that whole thing, JetBlue were not the only people who are objecting to this? KLM were the biggest people affected, and KLM and associated parties were litigating this in the in the Dutch courts. JetBlue were simply the toddler throwing the temper tantrum. So giving them credit for it and saying that throwing temper tantrums is going to work is actually the complete the exact opposite message you should get out of this. Certainly, JetBlue brought more public attention to it, but JetBlue is not the reason why the Schiphol slot imbroglio was resolved. All okay. right. <laughs> but it was, I feel it was after their uh, temper tantrum, as you say, that the U.S. government took a public stance towards it, and then uh, the Dutch government backed off, right? Because the Dutch Indian government, government backed off because of what the courts were. Yeah, the, because the courts were were running through this. So I said this: the the entire the process challenging this started long before JetBlue began their little temper tantrum thing. And remember, JetBlue is not a particularly well-run airline. JetBlue is dead. De I, I'm, okay, uh, full disclosure, I hold JetBlue stock, and it has underperformed really badly over the last while. So believe me, I keep an eye on JetBlue. It's not particularly well-run. It's actually, I, I've got a little bit more hope for it because they brought back Marty St. George now back into management. And yes, I think yes. Carl Icahn has taken a stake in the airline with two board seats. And Carl, for all his got to respect the fact that he wants results. So I think we will see JetBlue be a little less dreamy and more focused on results and probably do a little more focus on the business rather than focus on the publicity by throwing temper tantrums. But yes, that's that we're completely off topic now, heading off yeah. to a completely different region than yeah. that we should be focused on. So let's get back to Africa. Come on. Absolutely. Jeff. Absolutely. Not absolutely. But Africa roots. No, but it, it's fascinating because obviously we don't have massive conversations about slots and we don't have those challenges necessarily. We have different challenges, but it's great to to, to at least look at something that's a little bit different for those airlines that are, that are serving. They are the African airlines flying the flag around the world and serving those international destinations. And there are different ways of handling that experience. Let me just add one thing, and this is an important thing to note. I believe that in sub-Saharan Africa, there are only four airports, Baramji, correct me if I'm incorrect on this one, four airports that are IATA level three 
slot control classified. I believe it's Accra, it's Johannesburg, Cape Town, and is there a fourth or is there just three? Casablanca? The Sub-Saharan, yeah. Cairo, Casa, and all those are there. But Nairobi is not, Addis is not, Durban is not. Cape Town vacillates, I think, between two and three. But definitely Accra and Johannesburg are the only slot-controlled, regularly slot-controlled airport in South in Sub-Saharan Africa, where you need to apply for a slot before you can actually open flights in there. If, if air, airports were reaching capacity or wanted to artificially impose capacity constraints, yes, you could declare yourself as level three and get into a slot portfolio. So that's a, it's a straightforward process to do that. But that is why there really is a difference right now, because in Europe, every second airport is slot control level three, while in Africa, there's two or three at most in sub-Saharan Africa. So again, just apples yeah. and not even apples and oranges. Apples and sheep. Okay, great. I like it. We got a, we got a few more before we close. We got a few more little topics to discuss. Um, it wasn't the busiest month for route development news, but I think that's given us a chance to dive in a little bit deeper. One piece of news that I think we all sat up and took notice is Uganda Airlines adding a, a three CO or Neo? Which one was it, Sean? It's a CO. It's CO, a really okay. wrapped out CO. Okay. Well, let's uh, we'll gloss over that because it's new to them. Okay. So is yeah. is this the opportunity to obviously fill that gap that I think we've talked about before between CRJ 900s and the massive A330 800s? They don't have anything in the middle for those markets. Like we talked about with Turkish, right. with Ethiopian those markets that are narrow body focused and, and have that kind of level of demand. And it's what's missing from the Uganda Airlines um, fleet. So is that is it that simple? That, which routes is it going to be used on? Okay, so my understanding on this, and again, they've been very cagey in terms of what they have said publicly. They've just said that they're going to get an Airbus. They haven't specified the type or anything else, but they have filed with the, both the South African CAA and the uh, Uganda CAA, wherein all of these are sieves where information leaks out. So my understanding is that this is going to be an Airbus 320 coming from Global in South Africa, which is the parent or affiliated company with Lyft. And this aircraft is going to run, obviously, their daily Johannesburg service to Entebbe. But I also understand that it may be used, so it, you know, that'll be a step up from the CRJ, which is performance limited in terms of baggage, range, a whole lot of issues. But also it may be used on their Lagos route, which is currently too much metal with an A330 having to operate it. Uh, I think between that and possibly maybe other markets, maybe a Mogadishu, maybe a Kinshasa markets where you have some seasonal surges in demand where this gives them an option uh, on days it's not operating the Lagos in addition to the Johannesburg to uh, to bring it in. Uh, they've been very clear since the, I'd say the new administration, not that new anymore, but since Jennifer's administration has come in there, they've identified and have been in talks with the OEMs that there is a gap between the CRJ and the A330. Neither the CRJ nor the A330 are ideal aircraft for them, so they went and got both because that's what government-owned airlines do. Uh, when you have a choice between two bad decisions, let's take both of them. But yes, so they need either 737 MAX or an A320neo order to come in. But as Jennifer has said, the waiting list for these is many multiple years. And they need a solution now because they won't be around in many multiple years unless they do something. So wet leasing an A320 is the first step on that front. I think if the, the economics of this begin to work out, and wet leasing it from a southern hemisphere operator is great because that means in the northern summer, it's the low season for the operator. They can pull an aircraft out of lip lift the domestic schedule in the low season in South Africa and then put it on an ACMI and then cover it again over the summer. You've got enough time for the southern summer to be covered. So I think it's an ideal situation. I think it's taken them longer than they'd have liked to get to this point. But I think it will be the first indicator of them looking to fill that gap potentially with leases for either 737 or A320, depending on how this goes in terms of developing that market because attend to, to South Africa is currently only served by their CRJs and they do a piss poor job of serving it. The flights are payload restricted. They have crew issues there. It is just so unreliable that, you know, it, it, something has to change. And if this is the catalyst to bring that change. I hope that works for them. I wish them well because they're, it, it, they're a good bunch of people, good friends of mine there as well. And I, I want to see them succeed, even though they've been, literally they've been thrown into a fight with one hand tied behind their back. Yeah, yeah. And you don't see, 
And this is one for you as well, Baramji. So you've talked about 737 max, 737, A320. You don't see a 220 e, e, an ERJ coming in into the fleet. You think they need to have something a little bit larger gauge. What do you think, Baramji? No, the 220, I don't think so has any chance due to its unfortunate reputation associated with its engines in East and Southern Africa for the time being. Plus, again, they would have to wait a few years before getting a new 220. Going with a 320 CEO is the best short-term solution. It's also a cheaper solution, but they're, they're doing ACMI initially because their pilots and crew and all are not trained on it. And plus, at the end of the day, flying an A320 CMI is cheaper than an A330-800 on Lagos and Johannesburg. At the end of the day, Uganda Airlines are very desperate. And this is the quickest cost-cutting manner that they can operate those routes in a more commercially astute manner, I would say. Okay. Yeah, great. All right. Last couple of last couple of things then for you. Staying with you, Baramji, we saw this just the other day is Saudi launching Abuja three weekly with a, a treble seven. Uh, so that's Jeddah Abuja from the 11th of May. Are you excited about this route? You give it good, good, a good chance of being successful. So Saudi to Abuja has caught everyone by surprise, including me because it's, it was just announced with one month to go before the launch. And that too with the 777 uh, initially. The reason why I would say that they're starting off with the 777 is because of the Hajj season, which will start next month. So they will get very heavy loads outbound from Abuja into Jeddah, as well as connecting passengers to Medina. And they will get few connecting passengers via Jeddah to their network as well. The good thing about Abuja versus Lagos initially for the Saudi market is that Abuja is in the center of Nigeria, literally. And also it's the gateway to the Muslim majority north of Nigeria, where majority of the Muslim population of Nigeria reside. And these people, they live in Benin, Ilori, Sokoto, uh, Gombe, um, Maduguri, etc. And they all come to Abuja either by connecting flights or by road. And then they take a flight like Saudi for their pilgrimage, as well as for the intercontinental destinations. The Saudi connections via Jeddah for Abuja, I've seen it connects to Dubai, it connects to India. India has a slightly longer transit of four to five hours in one direction, at least, but it connects at least. It has also a connection to Guangzhou, I believe, I, I saw that, as well as other cities in the Middle East. JFK, though it has a backtracking, it does connect with a slightly longer transit. So there is potential for Saudi in Abuja. Also, the fact that Abuja will definitely get it business class demand, which will help with the yield. The only thing which I hope does not happen is that Saudi use a triple seven on Abuja year round, because that will definitely fail. Uh, between August and October this year, when there is no Hajj and Umrah is very low during that time, they would have to pivot. And I would recommend that they use a 321 Neo on that route. It's only five hours, five and a half hours maximum. So there's no problem on a 321 Neo. So because that time they will not have the demand level that they would need for a 777 to be filled up. And then from the winter season onwards, once the route has matured relatively, they can go back to a wide body, but not on a triple seven, preferably either a 330-300, which they use on all their uh, inner subcontinent routes, or they can do a 787-9. But the triple seven definitely is not warranted year round. Now, who would be affected by this? Definitely air pieces, market share and performance on the Jeddah route would be affected because Saudi will come aggressively. Saudi is not one that promotes high fares like Emirates or Qatar. Saudi will be very aggressive when it comes to engaging in poaching away market share and making sure that the fares are very cheap in order to gain that initial attraction. So there will be a bit of a fair war between themselves and Airpiece on the Jeddah route. And knowing Saudi's reputation, they will succeed in that versus 
airpiece. Okay, fantastic. No, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right on that. But one thing which I will give airpiece credit for, probably the only thing I've ever given airpiece credit for is their performance on the Jeddah route. What yes. they've actually been able to do is expand that O&D market. And we know that the demand is there. The demand was not being properly served. But what they've been able to do right now and push that Kano up to a daily 777-300 right now is incredible. And that market was large to begin with. It's in the 40,000s. But I'm fairly confident we'll see that market close to double this year, the, the Saudi-Nigeria market, thanks to Airpiece and now this new service from Saudi. So it's one of those, if you build it, they will come. The demand has been sitting under the surface. It's not been properly served and they've been able to unlock it. And I think, as you say, Saudi's response to it has been to, to well, to add their own services. And I think Saudi has a definite advantage over Air or Airpiece. They're both not necessarily professionally run, but at least Saudi knows how to do things right when they want to, while Airpiece struggles to even know what the right thing to do is. So I think Airpiece will suffer from it, from this, but I think the market is large enough for both of them. And I think, especially as this is Nigeria origin traffic, Airpiece's network will feed them far better from the, the Maidrugris, the Gombe's of the world than in Saudi, which is going to rely primarily on Abuja and the capital area traffic. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a good thing. I think it's a win for most people, and the Nigeria Saudi O and D market for 2024 will will show us some remarkable figures. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just to give some insight on figures, Nigeria Saudi in 2019 was 146,000, and 2023 it was 291,000. But majority of that was Kanu. Kanu out of the 291,000 took 204,000 passengers. And Abuja was number two at 53,000. So Abuja, Jeddah, Medina point to point grew from 36,000 to 53,000 between 2019 and 2023. Obviously, with this new nonstop link, it will grow much more in 2024, as you correctly said, Sean. But I feel uh, Saudi has, an, uh, an, has another good opportunity down the road with the 321 Neo flying Jeddah Lagos, not only for point to point, but also contributing to its network. Dubai, China, India, Beirut. Beirut is a big market from Lagos, as we all know. Istanbul, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, really interesting. Obviously, the the geography and the religious divides to an extent in in Nigeria play that the middle and the north is more Muslim, and the south obviously is is not so much. So that's why the Abuja, Kano, etc., makes a lot of sense. But some great numbers, and yeah, the Nigerian market super exciting. So the last couple of things before we close. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. There's also one, one other oh. advantage that Saudi has for West Africa, but particularly to Nigeria versus the GCC carriers, is that the flying time is almost three hours less. Jeddah to Abuja is only five hours, 20 minutes approximately. Jeddah to Lagos is just around six hours versus being eight hours almost from Dubai. So that means they can easily use a narrow body without any problems. Yeah, great. Well, other than great. flying over Sudan, but that's a fairly big problem right now. But other than that, oh. yeah, narrow body is very viable. But that's temporary, we hope. Yes, let's hope so. So Rima Mill, a couple of things. Emirates to Nigeria, as usual, Sean, that we said on the last podcast, that's likely. I think the Minister of Aviation of Nigeria has already announced it. Is it scheduled? Is it in the system yet? It's not in the system, but it is literally on the point of coming into the system. My my understanding from sources within Nigeria is Emirates is working on some final, basically, cash management issues that they're not going to wind up with their money stuck in Nigeria again. So they're working with some banks and payment providers to ensure that they get their money out ASAP. And once that issue is resolved, we could see them back in that market as soon as June and July this year. So the minister said that, and this time I'm tending to believe him based on what I'm hearing from sources on the ground in Nigeria who are working with Emirates on these issues. So it it, it will happen, it may not be immediately, but it is going to happen now. This is the relationship they've kissed and made up, and now soon enough they're going to start dating again. Okay, good. And also SAA, we saw that they're looking now potentially for permanent CEOs, CCOs, different posts after the Takatso deal fell through. What does that mean for the strategy, I think? Just briefly, because we don't know yet, but obviously we've talked about these things and obviously they've expanded into Sao Paulo, they're launching Perth, they've changed Perth a little bit, but is is it 
going to be the, the the baby goes out with the bathwater if they change the leadership, or do we think the strategy is going to continue? Okay, to, to say that South African Airways has a strategy is giving them far more credit than they're due. Uh, South African Airways, I don't think they know. They struggle to know who owns them. They, they have an existential crisis. <laughs> who, why am I? Who am I? And what am I doing? Yeah, I think there was a headline somewhere about them advertising for a whole bunch of new positions, saying that they seek to bring in some expertise. And I think that is so true, because the current CEO has, he's a doctor and professor of philosophy, yet he's trying to run an airline in a very competitive market. And I'm sorry, but he's also an avowed communist. It's another good point where you put a communist in charge of, you know, of, of, of potentially a commercial business. So yes, they, they can, there's only way to go is up. They need to bring in professionalism. They had professional professionalism in there when they restarted. And unfortunately, that professionalism in, you know, in Sakile, in Simon, and people like that were out the door. Uh, Thomas, their CEO initially, the professionals, the competent professionals left and were replaced by a bunch of people in acting roles, some of whom are decent, some of whom are not. And I think as, as long as this recruitment actually brings in professionals again, whether they're South African, international, whatever else, it's a positive but as long as it remains under government control, where the government says one thing and does something else, they are doomed to, they're a perfect example of when you lower standards enough, mediocrity is seen in a positive light. And that is exactly what South African Airways is right now. They have such low expectations from people that when they do even the smallest thing right, like seeking to replace a professor of philosophy as the chief executive officer, people give them you know, give them credit for it. This is basics. This They should have done yeah. this years ago. And they've already on their second chance. You know, they'll have a third chance. Yeah, and it's also election season. So these things do come up. You find that there's sort of new directions and conversations always around this time. But am I talking to the next CEO of SAA, Sean? No? If you're talking to Bear Amji, maybe, but I'll tell you, I would not wish that job on my worst enemy. I've been friends with a number of the last handful of CEOs, and remember, there have been 16 in the last 20 years, well, 15 if you don't count Nico twice, and I've known about half of them personally, and I swear, the happiest day in most of their lives has been the day that they resigned. So it is a job I would not <laughs> wish on my worst enemy. No, understood. No, it's, it's true. One, one CEO, actually, I, I, I sent them a message the day they quit. And they said, today is the happiest day of my life. I feel that a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. And I think that says it all about what that job was and continues to be. It is, it's, it's not something I'd wish on my worst enemy. You are, it's, it's a no-win situation. All right. All right. On that note, I think we're going to wrap it up for today. Thank you both for your awesome interaction and the preparation for this. And hopefully everybody out there did enjoy the conversation if you did please do hit the share button or share it on your social networks that would be really nice so that more people can listen you can amplify our, our listenership and get the african aviation market into more people's onto their phones and into their ears and into their brains and getting them as passionate as we are about seeing it being successful you can also leave us a review wherever you're listening so in the on the, the podcast store in the app store you can leave us a review there and then we'll be found by more people and i'm sure we haven't covered all the announcements there are more announcements anything that you do find out get in touch with us so we can include it in next month's episode and get in touch with us directly with any feedback on the show. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you for the next episode next month. Thank you. Bye.